Well, it's great to have you come today. Uh, I'm uh, certainly excited for this opportunity. Uh, it is always a blessing in my life when I have the chance to step into this great institution of learning uh, and just feel of the spirit here. Uh, it is amazing to come to a place where the spirit of God animates learning. And uh, today, as we think about learning, um, I uh, have a presentation uh, about seeing as the Lord sees, which is something that we try to do through the methodology of the principal approach, which is used here at American Heritage School. I, I imagine, uh, just as I was seeing people coming in, that there are some who are very familiar oh, <laughs> uh, with uh, the methodology. They teach it. They're masters at it, like Mrs. Updike. Uh, we have some maybe who are just coming to see for the first time what it's all about. We have parents of the school, friends of the school, uh, who are at varying levels of comfort uh, and expertise with the curriculum. And so I just feel it's such a blessing today to think about this opportunity that we have to educate our children, to have a stewardship from God. And it's amazing to think Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, it's amazing to think that God would allow us to come to this earth for the purpose of forming and sealing and exalting families. And so in all of the education that we ever espouse, let us remember the divine nature, not only of the individuals involved in the education process, but especially of every one of us um, in our Heavenly Father's plan. This is just uh, one of my most recent pictures uh, of my group of divine loved ones uh, whom I get to spend the most time with, uh, and we are working to be a family forever. Um, this is my wife, Christina, uh, and we have another little one on the way. Uh, we're going to name her Hope so that she can remember the source of true hope. Uh, we know that there is hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal. And that's why I am here today to share that testimony with you as I also share some philosophies and practices that help to lay Christ at the bottom, at the foundation of everything that we do. Uh, we also have sweet little Acadia here. And then there's my daughter Mia who is such a little mother. She, she mothers me, which is, is wonderful. Um, and little Joshi, uh, who loves to put holes in our, in our walls as he trains to be a protector, which we encourage, not the holes, but the protector part. Uh, and so it is just a blessing. Uh, and I want you to know that first and foremost, as I think about education being a matter of the heart and the home, uh, it comes back to this divine mandate that we see in the family proclamation that parents have a sacred duty to teach their children those things that God wants them to know. And so as we look at learning, let's think about Doctrine and Covenants 2934. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I went with uh, my family the other day to this duck pond, uh, and we went to sort of ride bicycles around it and walk. Um, and I was a little bit ahead of my wife, and as I was there with my daughter, uh, and we approached the pond, I started to realize why the word fowl can also be spelled a different way because of the smell. As I thought about the fowl in that pond and what they had done, um, and as I thought about them, I started to think, what, what a sort of miserable smell this is. I'm not really very happy. And the minute that that thought crossed my mind, my sweet little daughter Mia, who's right here in the middle, she looked up at me, and I hadn't said anything to her, and she said, Daddy, don't you just love that Jesus created a beautiful world for us? And it taught me something, that we really have a choice every day as we learn and as we teach. And I love how Doctrine and Covenants implies something very important about this choice. Wherefore, verily, I say unto you that all things, even the fowl, waterfowl, preserve unto me are spiritual, and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal. Neither any men nor the children of men, neither Adam your father whom I created, and I love 
this scripture because if we have eyes to see, we don't ever have to forget like I did in that moment and just see the negative. We can remember that Christ is behind all of it, that he truly has given us lessons that our children know better than us because they are so close to the Lord so many times. And as we think about this great quote from the Doctrine and Covenants student manual for Institute explaining this verse, from God's point of view, there is neither beginning nor end and all things are spiritual. Man makes a distinction between temporal and spiritual laws and some are very much concerned about keeping the two separate to the Lord. Everything is both spiritual and temporal. And the laws he gives are consequently spiritual because they concern us. They concern spiritual beings. And so when people put this artificial wall between learning in a spiritual way, looking for lessons that ennoble, they are living beneath their privileges. And we've heard something about that from President Uchtdorf recently. I just want to first testify that like my daughter, we can learn to see as the Lord sees. And why? Why does Heavenly Father want us to do it? Because as sweet Elder Workman said, we might see ourselves in terms of yesterday and today, but our Heavenly Father sees us in terms of forever. Although we might settle for less, Heavenly Father won't, for he sees us as the glorious beings we are capable of becoming. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of transformation. It takes us as men and women of the earth and refines us into men and women for the eternities. And I am so grateful for this lesson. The other day as I was putting on my tie, getting ready to head out the door, I had heard a little fracas, if you will, with the children. Um, and my son Josh, he called my daughter Mia a name that wasn't as flattering as it could have been. So I said, Joshy, come here. Uh, and I was going to talk to him and say, you know, Joshy, that is a bad name. You know you shouldn't use that name. You go apologize, you know. But in that moment, the Spirit whispered to me, testify about Mia. And so immediately, I was supplied with a story about Mia's birth. When she came out, we didn't know if she was a boy or a girl. We had tried via the ultrasound process to figure it out, but alas, it just wasn't happening. Um, and so it really was a surprise. I'll never forget seeing this sweet little one as she came out and she blinked her eyes at the world and she was so precious. And I felt angels in that room testifying that she was supposed to be a girl that we had worried was going to be a boy, a girl we bought, you know, both clothes to the, you know, the hospital. Um, and I was so, so touched that the spirit could let me know in that moment that gender is an essential characteristic of individual, pre-mortal and mortal identity and purpose and eternal identity and purpose, who we are, what we're supposed to be. And it's amazing to think that these special little ones are given to us and we need to see them as the Lord sees them. They are spiritual beings. And so in that moment, I told Josh this story and had to stumble through it. I was trying to tie my tie. Uh, and in that moment, he looked up at me and he said, Daddy, I love Mia. And I want to tell her. And so without even saying a word about the word he had said to his sister, I heard him scamper off with his little feet and I heard him say, Mia, I love you. Daddy told me why you are special. And I love you. And then I also heard him say, Mia, I'm sorry for calling you that name. Because you're special. And I shouldn't have used that. And I just want you to know that that was a principle that I was encouraged to teach by the Holy Ghost. It sunk down into his little heart. He's turning four today, so he really is a little heart. And he was then able to choose for himself as an agent to act with that principle embedded. And it grew into this beautiful flower that blessed his relationship with his sister. It was not externally motivated. I did not force him to do it. I did not tell him to do it. He figured it out for himself. He reasoned it because the true principle was taught. And I am so grateful that that's the way the Lord wants us to teach.
As we think about Elder Ballard speaking about the lessons of the past, the Lord wants us to look for these everywhere because learning doesn't just have to be a matter of names and dates and the sequence of events. I love what he says. We need to have meaning and messages that are written upon our hearts, those fleshy tables of our hearts, because there they cannot be erased. They cannot be effaced by the world. It is amazing to think that nourished by testimony and watered by faith, the lessons of the past can take root. And so as you and I teach the precious young ones in our midst, let us never forget that we are to help them discover lessons for themselves to reason these principles. And that's why we're here today, to learn how to do this. I love what Elder Iron at the time said. He said, as we think about education, uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful talk, education for real life, right? And then the real is true, truth is reality, the things that they really are, right? Your life is carefully watched over, as was mine. The Lord knows both what he will need you to do. I hope that's comforting for you because it's comforting for me. You have come and bless you for it. I pray that the Lord will give you whatever it is that you need. And you can take confidence knowing that we have a promise from a prophet, seer, and revelator that the Lord watches over you, that he knows what you will need to know. He knows what your children will need to know, not just for some grand manufactured conveyor belt curriculum in the sky, but for their individual missions on the earth. Because he is kind and he is all-knowing. So you and I can with confidence expect that he has prepared opportunities for you to learn in preparation for the service you will give. He will give you opportunities to learn what they need for the opportunities that he will give them in their lives. I'm so, so grateful for this lesson. We can walk with our heads held high knowing that in whatever way you feel the Lord wants you to educate your children, he will be able to help you tailor that education to meet their spiritual needs because it's not just math to him and it's not just geography to him. And it's not just history to him. These subjects are part of a grand and divine plan, which is for every single one of his children one day to attain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is why we are here. We are here to try to be like Jesus. So sing that sweet primary song with your children and sing it loud and sing it proud. Because that is our commission, to be like Jesus, to teach like Jesus, to walk with Jesus as we hold his hand so he can take us and our sweet loved ones by the hand and lead us unto salvation as we become like him. That's what this education is about. And so how do we do it? Why are we here? Well, today I am here to talk about a process that I have seen with my own children, in my own teaching, in my own life. Help us to reflect. Help us to produce. Help us to think in a way that turns the mind by our own volition to God and to his ways. A method that plants principles a method that looks for lessons, a method that transforms hearts and minds. And it starts with research, and it goes to reasoning, and then to relating and to recording. And this process can be done in so many ways, but this inspired for our process, as it is called in the principal approach, it is a process of teaching and learning that is able to transform character because it writes upon the heart. And it helps us to see education as the Lord sees it, that it is not just a matter of the mind, it is a habit of the heart. And so, how does this work? Well, we have a wonderful and inspired dictionary, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, as we see research. It is to diligently inquire and examine and seeking facts and principles. It, it can take so many forms. This is the discovery process where they learn for themselves, like my son learned for himself. As I talked 
to him so that he could discover rather than talking at him so that I can force him to do something. It's the difference between seeing our children as agents to act versus objects to be acted upon. It is the difference, ultimately, as it is learned and practiced throughout their lives between liberty and slavery. And so they research vocabulary, part of a word study. They might read a novel. They could perform an experiment or read a primary source. They could observe an activity. Maybe it's a dance. Right? You'll see that this research spans every piece of a school's or a home's curriculum. You can study a map or the grammar of a sentence. You can listen to a piece of music. You can examine a piece of art. You can inspect a mathematical formula. Whatever it might be, you can reason then, which is our next step, true principles, lessons that Christ would have us learn. Reasoning is to identify the cause or ground of conclusion. That which supports or justifies. This can take many forms as your sweet loved ones, as you and I research Right? And then, what do we do to reason? We define, we describe, we divide and classify, compare and contrast, determine cause and effect, identify particulars, summarize and evaluate. This is where the understanding comes. The understanding of the particulars that then we're going to apply in our next step. All of this is in order to learn principles and lessons. We need to know that learning in this way is not an excuse for mediocrity in any sense. In fact, if you read what Elder Iyer at the time said in Education for Real Life, you will know that learning as the Lord would have us learn is a motivation for excellence in academics. It pushes us not just to pass tests, but to become like Jesus. And that takes a whole <coughs> bunch more work than anything we could ever do to pass a test. And so, where does this start to sink down to the hearts once they have reasoned these principles? We see that to relate is to tell or recite, to apply fact and truth to life and knowledge. And so what does this mean for us? How would we embrace this with our children? From your research and reasoning, apply principles and lessons to your life and knowledge through connecting them to situations in your life, the wider world, other areas of study, and the words of ancient and modern prophets. This is the step where the spirit infuses the learning with a witness that these abstract truths, these abstract lessons, they weren't just for other people in other times. They're for us today. They really are for our lives. And the Lord, once again, will let us know how and why and where and when. And so... As we think about then recording all of this so that we don't forget it, because we know that it is a godly characteristic to write and know that Lehi recorded things for his sons and his daughters so that they would be able to know the source, the source of their salvation. They would not forget their way. We know that this principle of recording is so important because think about all the times your life has been changed by truths in the Old Testament or the New Testament or the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine of Covenant or the Pro Great Christ or a conference talk. Imagine if we hadn't written those things down. Right? We need to write these things down. And so we write a regular, authentic, official copy. This is each student, right? This is not a consumer-based model of education. This is a producer model of education in which students act, students create, students think and record their thoughts so that they, once again, are agents to act so that they remember when they learn to see as the Lord sees, and they write down that impression. Elder Iron, now President Iron, has told us that we should have a journal, that we should write down those spiritual impressions to store them away for a dark day so that we can go back and learn from the light that God has already given us. We don't always need to look for a new solution to an old problem. The Lord has already given us so much. And if we keep a record, we can go back to it. And that's what we encourage students to do through the notebook method, which is a method of recording in a personal notebook that they keep and care for and treasure through the years, rather than a workbook method where they fill it out and they throw it away because they haven't invested anything in it. And so throughout the four hour process, in this notebook, they create a written record of the principles and lessons that they have learned from their research and reasoning and relating through notes, summaries, 
essays, theses, projects, journals, letters, poems, speeches, plays, the sky is the limit. Just help them to record it so that they can save it and bless their own lives and also the lives of others. I have been so amazed this year as my children continually ask my wife and I, would you tell us a story from when you were young? That's what they want all the time now. Instead of reading a book at bedtime, tell us a story from when you were young. It is amazing to go back to these stories as we have recorded them. Our students, our children, love to remember. It is a God-like principle. Um, so, what does this look like? Well, for a younger child, or just a simpler model that we can do, right? you can read a poem, and that's the research phase, just the reading of it. You reason principles and lessons from the poem. You can talk through them. Depending on the age of the child, they can do it independently. You relate them by asking that student in a discussion or on his or her own to apply those principles and lessons to their lives. And then the record, once again, this is happening throughout in the notebook, right? They're recording their reasoning and relating so that they can preserve this record. And then afterwards, there might be an activity where they record by writing a poem of their own that teaches the same principles and lessons to see if those have sunk deeply enough into their hearts. Of course, for older students, right, we can scale this model up, right? And here's what it might look like. As we think about different types of record activities, they could be formative. Think of helping us to appreciate every step on a hike up the mountain, enjoying the journey. Or they could be summative, where at the end, there's a large record activity that helps them to go back. And from the top of the mountain they just climbed, see the valley below and describe it in its beauty, in its magnificence. And so, you might read a political treatise with your student. You might ask him or her as part of the record to mark, to annotate main ideas, key terms, confusing concepts, unknown vocabulary, cause and effect relationship, or examples. Once again, this is the research. And then, right, you reason. Once again, principles and lessons from the treatise. Record them in your notebook. Complete these short answer questions. These are open-ended questions, right? This is not a question of a date or a fact, though. Our students will learn those in the process as well, right? This is helping them to think critically and analytically, to open their minds and their hearts, and to record once again, right? Uh, to further expand their reasoning abilities. The same process is followed, right? With this older child in a relate with another formative report activity, where they apply the principles and lessons to their lives. They record their applications in their notebook. They can complete more of these open-ended questions, and then their relating is expanded. Finally, right, let your children choose as they record, as they really master, and as they try to write these finally in a summative way, in a concluding way upon their hearts. Let them choose between perhaps an analytical or a creative assignment or many different other types of assignments that help them to cement the learning, right? To demonstrate, solidify, to record their growth from their research and their reasoning and their relating. This is a blessing. Uh, and I want right now to go back with you to 1774. If you take a look here, this is a painting by a man who worked in many different odd jobs on ships. His name was Ashley Bowen. And you can find his journal. Um, I have it at my house. Uh, it's bound by the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. Uh, he painted this 11 years before in 1763. This is the town of Marblehead in Massachusetts, a beautiful old town. By some counts, if you were to go visit it today, it has more colonial and revolutionary era buildings that are still existing in the town than any other place in North America, so it's a beautiful place to go and visit. Uh, here we see this is St. Michael's Episcopal Church, the Ang Anglican Church of the day. This is the old meeting house, and you'll see the steeple of the new meeting house there um, on your right. Those are both congregational churches coming from the Puritan heritage. Uh, here in this town, we see some amazing, amazing contributions to the American Revolution as it played out its course between 1764 and 1775, before the war secured what the revolution had gained in hearts and minds. Uh, and so, with you, uh, you might notice that there are some papers uh, that are sitting across uh, the uh, front of the seats. Uh, maybe you've already picked them up. Uh, this is a four-hour exercise, because I didn't want to just talk about the four-hour process. I wanted you to learn by doing, to have an opportunity to come and to do the work that it takes 
um, to learn. Uh, this is a piece of uh, my graduate work when I was in a PhD program at Brandeis University in the Boston area. Uh, this is from my own uh, research and reasoning and relating, uh, as you'll see. Uh, this is from a story, just a small piece of it. Um, a story of a transformation, a transformation in hearts and minds. And so, as we take a look at this four-houring process, as we research, as we reason, as we relate, and then record, I am going to invite you to do something. I want you to know that you will be blessed as you do it. Um, I am so grateful for the stories of courage, the stories of faith, the stories of patriotism, the stories of being true to principles uh, that this just couple page excerpt contains. And so, uh, what I'd like you to do then is to take, take about 10 minutes. And as you take those 10 minutes, you and you can work with your neighbor, you can work it individually, whatever you prefer, uh, I would invite you to read. And as you read, I'd like you to look for some things. Okay, and that is the reasoning process. Okay? You have margins on the side. Please fill them up with your own record. Whoops. With your own record of what you learn. What principles or lessons can you reason from Revolutionary Marblehead in 1774? What can you reason about consent and popular sovereignty and government? What can you reason about the ideas and practices that made the American Revolution? What can you reason about the character and values of the Whigs, the Patriots? Remember, as John Adams said, the revolution was effected before the war commenced. The revolution, the true American revolution, was in the minds and hearts of the people. And so look for that revolution in minds and hearts. Once again, you have 10 minutes. Please, reason. And we will then come back together and we will relate. Please make a record throughout this process and then as we talk, following your research and your reasoning. Go ahead. service to you, you just flag me down with a hand.
uh, this would be an activity uh, that would bless uh, an entire class period. Uh, so don't feel bad if you're still thinking about things. And, uh, the four hour method takes time. It truly does to do it right. Um, what I'd like to do though is just to give a taste of reasoning and then relating that we'll do with this process. I would like to ask you now, um, even if you're not quite finished yet, that's okay, this is yours to keep, enjoy it. Okay. Um, what did you reason? What did you find as you researched? Please. Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. What is your name? Andrew, thank you. I'm sorry? Repeat your comment. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. The revolution really began at the most basic of local levels. Did I get it right? Okay. Guys, as, as we think about this, uh, remember, as we think about government, as we think about self-government, which is another blessing of this four-hour approach, we first start with ourselves, and we see that this change in identity from considering oneself as being British and calling for rights within the British Empire, which, remember, was known as the Empire of Liberty at that time. It was the freest of all the empires on the earth. But remember, this nation, this nation was prophesied to be choice above all other lands, not just choice. And so we went from the choice liberties of our British heritage uh, to even more, and it began at the local level as we saw hearts and minds changing, calling for, after 10 years, rights without the British Empire in this political reconstitution that would eventually form a new nation. Thank you so much for that. Started at the local level. Thank you. What else did you reason, please? So those in the townhouse who voted were in agreement. Those who didn't attend the meeting and didn't vote, as we can see, some of them weren't in agreement. This brings up a very important point, right? Marblehead at this time was one of the communities in Massachusetts that worked for the 17th century ideals of harmony, unanimity, consensus in their politics. And so what we see is that ministers would talk about turning to the Lord as one man. If in today, right, we see a vote where it's 70 to 30, right, and we say, oh, that was a strong victory for the candidate who received 70% of the popular vote. In Massachusetts, in these towns that practice a consensus form of democracy, they saw that as a defeat. They wrung their hands because of the faction in their community that 30% that was not unanimous, that was not united in heart as well as mind. And so they worked always in this community for these ideals of a consensus democracy. We see that will change, that will change. And obviously it's certainly changed today. But yet, isn't it interesting that what does the Lord ask us to be? He asks us to be a Zion people of one heart and one mind. That's unanimity. They had a glimpse of that, and they worked towards that. And so as they tried to help these wayward tea vendors, if you will, to come into the fold of consensus, they were practicing Christian virtues as they understood them. They truly were trying to help convince their friends through many different means to join the fold. And uh, if we had more time, um, hundreds of pages in this thesis, uh, demonstrate that very struggle for consensus. So that's a great question. You hit on something very important to this town. Thank you so much. What else did you reason, please?
so much, so many amazing principles in there. We start to see groups working for change in government in many, many different ways because of voting and their ability and knowledge of voting as well as with their pocketbooks, right? These pocketbook wars for different causes, right? We, we see it today, right? You might support a certain product because of the values behind it. You might withdraw support from a certain product or a certain company because of the values behind it that you don't agree with, right? So I love that. What a, what a great and rich comment. Uh, as we relate this and we really think about what the Lord has in store for us, and once again, we could go through so many things um, from this reasoning, and, and I'm sure there are hundreds of more comments that we could put together, and I'm just so sorry. Um, given just the five or so minutes, I get fully well, about five minutes or so that we have left, as we relate this and think about why it is that we could see people shifting allegiance, why it is that these people could reconstitute themselves, why it is that they could form their own governing bodies that were made legitimate by simply the force of their own consent, because consent is the lifeblood of government. I love where it starts, and this great wheel here, this cycle, is one that men like John Locke wrote about. It was a cycle that would have been familiar right, to these founding fathers and mothers in places like Marblehead. As we relate it, you might see I've added a few things uh, that would be more in line with the blessings that we have from a restoration perspective. Um, God grants his children rights to life, liberty, and property. He also gives them knowledge of good and evil, opposition, and the power of agency to act and not to be acted upon. He holds them accountable for what they do with his gifts. Right? This is what God has given to each of us, these gifts. What are we going to do with them? Well, as we think about a social contract and governance role, the people create a contract in which they loan some of their power to establish government, and government exists to protect their God-given rights. We see the men of Marblehead as they voted, believing in this social contract, realizing that it was fractured, and trying to change it. And they changed it through consent of the governed. Right? They tried various times over the previous decade Right, to keep it alive and legitimate, beneficial, and in check by exercising consent through many things, such as obedience to laws, service, making their voices heard in support, or then eventually opposition, voting, and amending their contract if needed. And why? Why could they do this? Because eventually God has given us the power to act and not to be acted upon. We see popular sovereignty that the people, because of this gift from God, are the highest authority in government. They give it life. They have the right to alter or abolish it. Go through the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. You will see every single one of the parts of this cycle described in detail by Jefferson and the other minds at work on that great document. When their creation violates the contract, the people exercise their ultimate authority, of course, given to them by God, the ultimate sovereign, and power to alter or abolish it, even if that means revolution. That is exactly what you read about the people exercising sovereignty, the people changing things internally first, and then we see the external change. They start to create their own governments in Massachusetts that were not legitimate in the eyes of the paper sovereign, but they were legitimate in the eyes of the people who mattered, the people themselves. So today, as you think about relating this to your lives, unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to talk, we could talk about this wonderful process for hours, and we should, and I invite you to. Um, but remember that if we relate this, we can think about acts in our own lives that can help us to show consent, to withdraw consent, to make our voices heard, to remember that we are the masters of government and not the other way around, to stand up for causes that are true and just, so that like those great Christians, between 64 and 67 AD in the reign of Nero after that great fire in Rome as he sent out the legions to come to their houses and ask them, are you Christians? They could stand up and even though they knew it would mean death or imprisonment or banishment or worse, they could say, I am a disciple of Christ. Do what you will with me. And they would go to their death having a bright hope in Christ that he would raise them up.
I bear testimony that we can do these things with our children, that we can help them to see as the Lord sees, that we can make learning not just a matter of facts, but a matter of faith, that we can help them to develop not just methods of the mind, but habits of the heart, that we can help them to be agents who act to transform themselves internally as Christ transforms them and fits them to attain the measure of the stature of his fullness. And I bear that testimony to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.